Welcome to Meat on the Grill. We have a primal connection to cooking with meat and specifically cooking with fire. Um, our early ancestors sort of abandoned their hunter-gatherer ways um, with the advent of cooked food. And what that did is it allowed us to become much more intelligent beings. Turns out finding and consuming raw food takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. Freeing up that time and energy um, basically developed humans into civilizations. It's believed that cooking with meat likely was the result of some sort of a, a mistake or an accident, probably suspending meat around a fire to keep it away from predators, and then realizing the results of that, picking up the flavor of the smoke, uh, picking up the, ten the changing of the protein structure, and making it more palatable. So today, we've got several selections of meat, and I like to refer to these as value cuts. Um, these are four cuts of meat that come from the 60% of the animal that we don't really think about all that much. Much of our focus when we think about grilling meat comes from the 40% of the animal that's the short loin and the rib. These pieces of meat come from the shoulder and the, the leg section of the animal, so they're much more affordable. Um, on the left here, we have a tri-tip. Uh, then we have what's called a terrace major or a chuck tender. Two different names for it. The terrace major is the specific name of the muscle. Uh, we refer to it as a chuck tender in the kitchen. A uh, flat iron steak here and a hanger steak. So these are all great pieces of meat. Uh, the tri-tip actually um, sort of presents an interesting meal on its own because of the shape of it. If you grill this off, you end up with the sort of crispy end pieces that are kind of well done. And then the thicker center portion actually would be a, a rare, more tender piece of meat. So we're gonna explore some different recipes with several of these cuts. So I'm just gonna move this out of my way. For our first recipe today, we're gonna take a look at the way in which other cultures handle their protein intake. So this is a recipe that has a small amount of meat, a small amount of protein, and a lot of vegetables and fragrant herbs and spices with it. So um, I'm gonna start off by making a marinade, and I'm gonna make the marinade in this Ziploc baggie. So we're gonna um, make the marinade, and then we're gonna marinate this overnight. Uh, I have some lemongrass here, which we're going to add in. Some cilantro leaves, chopped. Uh, some ginger, freshly chopped ginger. Uh, this is palm sugar and some minced garlic. To that, I'm gonna add some peanut oil. Some fresh lime juice and fish sauce. Fish sauce is a fermented product uh, that they use a lot in Southeast Asian cultures. It's also a salting agent, very, very flavorful, very fragrant. So lots of big flavors here. Um, I'm gonna take the hanger steak now, I'm gonna put it into my marinade. And I'm just gonna close this up. I use the bowl here as a vehicle to keep everything in place so it doesn't spill or fall over and make a mess in my kitchen. Get that excess air out of there. And that will just go into the refrigerator overnight. Now I have that same hanger steak and that same marinade, which we have marinated overnight. So I'm gonna take this out of the bag. I'm gonna just set it on some paper towels here to dry off a little bit get some of the excess water off the surface. I don't wanna lose all those aromatics, I just wanna lose some of the water. Next, we're gonna take a look at our grill. So we're using mesquite charcoal today. As we know, mesquite produces a very high heat and a very flavorful sort of fragrant aroma to it. So looking at the grill, I'm gonna check for hot spots. I'm gonna use the oiled rag method to check for hot spots. So I'm looking for that smoke like that to come off the grill. That tells me I'm at the right temperature. So I'm just gonna place these steaks right there on that hot spot. So I have some romaine lettuce here. Um, I'm gonna sort of pull off the outer kind of wilty leaves. Just get to the nice crispy core, the heart. 
And I'm just gonna cut this up into bite-sized pieces. What I generally do is just split the whole head right down the middle like that. I usually discard the first cut, sort of, again, wilty, not fresh. And then I'm just gonna cut this into, like I said, bite-sized pieces. With romaine, one of the things that you need to be aware of is when you get down here, there's this, uh, actually it's not here. A lot of times this piece here extends up into the romaine and that ends up in my Caesar salad almost every time I order it. Somehow I'm lucky that way. So I wanna remove that. So I'm gonna put this lettuce mixture into the bowl. You can hear my steaks sizzling away over there. That's the water being forced out from the heat, expelling the moisture out of there, drying those out, starting the, the cooking process, denaturing the proteins. Next, I have some uh, spicy Thai bird chilies. So I'm gonna cut those up. Those are um, uh, used a lot, again, in Southeast Asian cuisine. So very, very spicy. So I'm gonna cut these into small pieces. And these are just gonna add a little fire to an already fiery dish. And I'm gonna do seeds and all. So this is a, a Thai style marinade. So these are Thai bird chilies. So obviously used a lot in that cuisine. And now we're gonna check on our grilled steaks. So I can tell by feeling this that it's nice and rare, which is exactly what we want. And these are pretty thick steaks. These are about, uh, these cook for about seven, eight minutes because they're, they're very thick and there's a lot of water in the meat and so it takes some time for those to cook. Um, and taking these directly off the grill now, these, these steaks are very hot. And as we know, heat affects water activity. So if I just cut into the steak right now, I'm gonna lose a lot of water. Those water molecules are moving very rapidly. So I want that process to slow down, that water movement to slow. And then I'm gonna cut these in about three or four minutes after they've rested. We call that resting when we allow that water activity to minimize. And now our steak has rested. So we're gonna go ahead and slice this up. And what I'm gonna do is I've got a lot of juice here, um, even just sitting. And that juice, actually, I'm gonna capture that. That's gonna become our dressing for this salad. So um, I'm gonna just allow the juice to kind of mingle in with these fresh Thai bird chilies. You can see the meat here nice and rare. And then in order to capture this, I have my bench scraper here. I'm just gonna transfer all of this into the bowl. And then I'm just gonna mix this gently here. I just wanna coat the lettuce leaves with the beef juices. And you have all of those fragrant ingredients from the marinade now that have been toasted. So all that lemongrass, the garlic, the ginger, all those flavors sort of melding in here. And then you have the nice fresh crisp lettuce leaves. So once I feel this is nicely coated, ready to plate. So I do want a substantial amount of greens here, but I do want to highlight the meat as well. That's kind of the star of the show with this dish. So, And again, placing these things kind of gently, loosely with my fingers so I get some nice height. And then to garnish this, I have some fresh mint sprigs. And notice that these still have the stems on them and the cilantro. The, it's not uncommon in, uh, in Southeast Asian cultures to have both the leaves and the stems and even the roots of the different fresh herbs used. And then finally, we're just gonna add some toasted peanuts, which really add some crunch. Um, and that peanut flavor is a really distinct ingredient in the cuisine of that region. So there we have our marinated Thai beef salad with toasted peanuts and fresh herbs. Next, we're gonna talk about dry rubs. Here we have uh, some spices. So we have some allspice, some toasted cumin seed, whole, whole black peppercorns, dried oregano, and cinnamon sticks. I've taken all those, toasted them, and then ground them in a spice grinder into this mix here. Uh, we add to that some salt, 
and then we place that dry rub directly on our piece of meat. And what that does is starts to infuse and permeate the flavors of those ingredients into the meat. Also, the salt starts to denature the proteins and dry out the surface. Um, so you get sort of the double edge of, of flavoring and also seasoning of the salt and, and beginning of the cooking process, really. So I'm gonna place this on the grill. I'm just gonna get a little, uh, a little oil on the grill here real quick. Always like to oil the grill before I put things on there, just keep them from sticking. So while that's cooking, we're gonna take a look at our next marinated preparation. So here we have a marinated terrace major or chuck eye, chuck tender. And in that we have some fresh herbs. We have fresh thyme and fresh tarragon. We have fresh bay leaves and dried peppercorns. And that's all mixed with some olive oil, a little salt and pepper. And we have that already marinated in the Ziploc bag like we showed you earlier with the Thai style beef. So I'm gonna take this out. Um, again, I'm gonna place this on paper towels just to get that excess fat off of there. If I put a really oily marinated item directly on the grill, it's very likely that I'm gonna get a flare up on that. I'm gonna get some fire, which I don't want. So I'm gonna go ahead and place this on the grill. And since we're serving steak, it's kind of a necessity that we would have some potatoes to go along with that in some form. So I have these beautiful little, we call them marble potatoes. So they're different colors, different sizes, but none of them are really any bigger than this guy right here. So they're really small, delicate potatoes. I have some aluminum foil here. What I'm gonna do so I'm gonna take a sheet of aluminum foil, I'm gonna open this up. I'm gonna place the potatoes. Also, there's a couple of cloves of garlic in here, and there's a sprig of rosemary. Those are really just to flavor the potatoes. You can eat the garlic after you've made this, it's perfectly fine. Um, I'm gonna add some salt and pepper. And I'm gonna add a generous amount of olive oil And then I'm gonna fold this up into a little pouch. So I'm gonna start at the top, and I wanna make sure that this is fully encapsulated because I don't want anything getting in or out of this. So I'm gonna fold, kind of roll the top down, sealing it all the way down until I get a nice tight fit on the potatoes. And then I'm gonna do the same on the ends. And then I do a, a second piece of aluminum foil just to be on the safe side because again, I wanna trap the oil and the flavorings in here. And I wanna trap the steam in here as well because the steam from the potatoes is actually what's cooking these potatoes. And the other reason I don't, I wanna make sure these are sealed really well is because I'm gonna cook them directly in the coals. So these, while I'm grilling on top, you may have space limitations on your barbecue. Uh, this guy just goes right down here and cooks in the coals while you're cooking your steaks above. So these guys have uh, cooked now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna rotate these 45 degrees. And that's so that we get even grill marks and also more even cooking from the different uh, nuances of the heat transfer through the metal and the heat coming up between the grates. So now we're gonna cook these for probably another seven to eight minutes and then we'll come back and slice them. And now we're gonna check on our steaks. So our flat iron, I can tell, is done. The terrace major is a little bit thicker. I think actually we're good there as well. So another way to determine doneness, and probably the most effective way, is with a digital thermometer. So I have here a digital thermometer, and when I check this, uh, especially with something like the flat iron that's thinner, I wanna make sure that I check it from the side. So I'm going directly into the middle of the steak in the center because if I go in vertically, I could be off by even a quarter of an inch in either direction. It's probably gonna be 10, maybe 15 degrees off. So this is perfect. I'm at about 125 degrees, which is exactly where I wanna be. So I'll take that off as well. So now I'm gonna allow these to rest for a few minutes. With the flat iron, uh, it's a, an elongated muscle and the muscle fibers run in specific directions. We call that the grain of the meat. And so we wanna make sure that we identify the grain and that we're not cutting with that grain because that makes things really chewy. So we wanna cut against the grain. So that's what I'm gonna do here. Um, I'm just gonna cut down. Really nice steak, perfect medium rare in the center. 
and I'm gonna leave these in sequence like this, and I'm just gonna use my knife to transfer them right over here to the plate, keeping everything in sequence. Just kinda open that up so I get a nice look at the beautiful red color of the meat. And there's our dry rubbed flat iron steak. Now we're gonna take a look at our potatoes that we put into the coals earlier. So those have been cooking for about 15 minutes. And I can, I can actually hear the sizzle inside the pouch here from that steam and oil cooking away at the potatoes. So I'm just gonna gently peel this back. Smells great. So you can see uh, that they're cooked, obviously. They're nice and soft. You can see that one's broken. But I have this, like some interesting coloration here so that, it, in, that contact with the coals and the aluminum foil generates little hot spots. So I get these brown, even charred uh, little areas on the potatoes that are really great for flavor development. Really, really nice little flavoring element. And then I have the fragrant rosemary and the garlic infusing their flavor the entire time that the potatoes are cooking. So I'm gonna go ahead and put those on the plate. And then we're gonna come back and cut our steak, which is now nicely rested. So now our chuck tender. Um, again, looking at the grain of this, I can see very clearly that the grain runs that way. Um, so I'm gonna cut this on a little bit of a bias cut at an angle. And again, I'm gonna use my knife and then I'm just gonna fan this right around those beautiful potatoes, exposing the beautiful medium rare center. And there is our marinated Terrace Major or marinated Chuck Tender steak with coal roasted potatoes. So looking back at our value cuts, we have our marinated Thai style hanger steak, our dry rubbed flat iron, and our marinated terrace major with coal roasted potatoes. For our next recipe, we're gonna look at a hamburger, but this is no ordinary hamburger. We're using lamb as our meat, and we're using flavors of the Mediterranean in the preparation of the burger. But the most interesting thing about the burger is that we're gonna have the cheese component inside the burger instead of on top. So let's get started. First thing I'm gonna do is add some milk to some bread here. And the idea is I wanna soak the bread with the milk, soften up the bread, and that's gonna become a binder for our burger. So that's gonna to help to hold things together. So while that's softening up a bit, I'm gonna add some onions to this mix. So these are onions that have been sweated. When we sweat something, we wanna extract the water from it to concentrate the flavors of the sugars. We don't wanna get color on it like caramelization, we just wanna intensify that sweet flavor. Those are very different flavors, sweated onions and caramelized onions. Uh, next, we have some minced garlic, a uh, little bit of dried oregano, some fresh parsley, so both dried and fresh herbs in the preparation. And then we're gonna put an egg in here, and that's also gonna help to bind things down. And then we're gonna put in some feta cheese, a generous amount of the feta cheese. So I'm gonna take a little, I don't need all of this bread as a binder, I don't have a whole lot of meat in here, so I'm gonna take about a quarter cup of my binder. I'm gonna season this well with some salt and pepper, keeping in mind that the feta cheese is somewhat salty on its own, so I'm not gonna add a lot of salt to this, and I can also season it on the grill if I don't feel like it's seasoned well enough at the end. So I'm gonna mix this all up. I'm just gonna get in here with my hands. That's really the best way to do this. I wanna make sure that I mix it really well so all the ingredients are thoroughly incorporated. And as I'm mixing this, what happens is the ingredients start to warm up, the meat warms up, the fat in the meat starts to soften, and the mixture becomes pretty wet, pretty loose. And so if I were to try and grill this right after I mix it, it probably wouldn't work out all that well. It'd probably be a little bit too wet. So what I wanna do is refrigerate this for a couple of hours after I form the patties so that I solidify those ingredients back together. 
So now I wanna take the patty that's been refrigerated and I wanna put a little bit of oil on that just to help keep things from sticking. And once again, oil conducts heat. I'm also gonna dust just a little additional salt on here. So you can see I have this on a parchment paper square and what that does is it allows me to uh, move it to the grill rather easily. It also enables me to make a lot of these and even stack them up if necessary if I'm making a lot of burgers. So I'm gonna place this on the grill and I literally just slap that down and then pull the parchment paper right off of that. So while that's cooking, take a look at our pickled onions. So I have some sliced onions, what we call julienne onions. So these have been cut laterally into kind of half moon shapes and they're about an eighth of an inch wide each. I'm gonna add to that some sumac Sumac is a Middle Eastern berry. It's much like paprika, but it's got a little bit of a, a lemony sort of hue to it. Uh, I'm gonna add a generous amount of sumac. I'm gonna add a generous amount of sugar. Sugar's gonna kinda counteract the acidity of the onions. And then I'm gonna add some sherry vinegar to that. So what that's gonna do is it's gonna soften up the onion, it's gonna tenderize the onion, and it's gonna flavor the onion at the same time. So it's a form of, of quick pickling. Uh, but that process takes about an hour to really transform for that acid to attack the cellulose structure and kind of break down the onions into soft, uh, translucent little slivers. So I have some that I've made ahead of time here. You can see the difference in the color. The color's changed, softened up quite a bit. It's not crunchy anymore. So this is what we're looking for in the, in the pickled onion, the, that flavor and that, uh, that soft texture in there. So next, we have our bun. So our bun, we have a brioche bun here. So brioche is my favorite bread, probably because it's made with lots of butter and lots of eggs, which are two of my favorite things. Um, so I'm gonna do this dry. I'm not gonna add anything to this. I just wanna get a little bit of toast on here. So I'm gonna go directly on the grill and I'm gonna press down gently on this just so that I get nice even grill marks. Now I'm gonna rotate my burger. So I wanna make sure one of the key mistakes that people make when they're cooking burgers or anything on a grill is trying to move it too soon. So you need that to sit on the grill and form a crust. Things are really, proteins are really soft when they go on the grill and they just sort of dangle down between the grates. And if you try and get a spatula under there, you're likely to shear off that crust on the bottom. So I can tell just by lifting the corner of this up that it's not sticking to the grill. I've formed a nice crust on there and I just wanna rotate this 45 degrees now to get those nice grill marks on there. Take a look at my bun. Brioche also cooks very, very quickly. So you gotta be careful not to burn the brioche bun. So I have some romaine lettuce here. Um, again, I'm gonna cut the ends of that off because I don't need that. And I'm just gonna do a little shredded romaine. So a little chiffonade again, that leafy cut, thin cut vegetables. I don't need very much. I have some beautiful heirloom tomatoes. So I'm gonna do a couple of slices of tomato. Beautiful. And then I have, as a condiment, I have tzatziki. And tzatziki is a mixture of yogurt and cucumbers in some form. In this case, we have um, red onion added in here as well, and then mint as the herb, because we want mint to complement the flavor of the lamb burger. So this is gonna take about another four, three to four minutes to cook. I'm gonna flip this over. You can see we've got our nice grill marks there, and we'll come back to this in just a moment. And now we're ready to take our burger off the grill. So I'm gonna leave this on the spatula so I'll be able to get it onto the burger in a moment. And we're gonna start to assemble our burger. So I'm gonna do this right on the plate. So I'm gonna take the brioche bun. I'm gonna add some tzatziki to the bottom bun because I want that for moisture, that's our sauce. So that would be in place of traditional mayo or ketchup that we might have in this country. And then I'm gonna place the burger right on top of that sauce. I'm gonna come back with my shredded lettuce. Generous amount of shredded lettuce. And then I'm gonna use my tomatoes to kind of hold that down in place. 
and then just a few of my pickled onions. So these are nice and wilty now. You can see that if these were in that raw stage, they just fall right off. So this sort of enables them to stay in place. I'm gonna put another little dollop of satsiki right on the top here. And I'm just gonna present this burger in a semi open face sort of manner. So I'm just gonna lean the bun right up against this so that I don't cover up all those beautiful colors. And then I can let the person who's eating this sort of assemble that and finish off that sort of solidification process on their own. And here we have our Mediterranean lamb burger with tzatziki, pickled onions on a brioche bun. So no exploration of meat would be complete without adding pork to the mix. So today we're gonna to take a look at a pork tenderloin. This is a relatively uh, lean cut of meat. Pork over the years has sort of been bred to have less and less fat, and this particular cut is from an area of the animal that's not really exercised all that well. So you see there's very little connective tissue, very little fat, very little marbling of any kind. So uh, we wanna treat this pretty delicately. So what I'm gonna do uh, is I'm gonna do a, a process we call butterflying. So what I've done is I've taken a regular Ziploc bag and I've cut the ends of it so that it opens up into a sheet. And you could do this at home with plastic wrap, um, but really what we want to do is, um, is just pound this out. And with the Ziploc bag, it actually uh, adds a little bit more strength, so it's a little more structure to it. So I have here a uh, meat hammer, a tenderizing hammer. So this has three distinct sides to it. So it's got a, a large side here for tenderizing really tough cuts. Uh, smaller here for tenderizing, semi-tough cuts, and then for, for my purposes, I just want to use the flat side because I just want to flatten this piece out. Um, and when I'm pounding, what I generally do is I'm going to be not just pounding down, but sort of pounding and pushing at the same time and pounding and pulling at the same time, so I'm stretching this piece of meat out. So by doing this, I'm making a uniform thickness throughout the entire piece. And again, that stretching, pulling motion here. So now I've got a, a piece that rather than being tapered on the ends and different thicknesses all the way through, is one clean, thick piece here. So I'm gonna set that aside for a moment. So for our marinade, I wanted a, uh, this is sort of an Asian flavor profile. So I have some hoisin sauce here. Uh, and then I'm gonna add to that some chili garlic paste, some rice wine vinegar, soy sauce, sesame oil, fresh ginger, chopped cilantro, and chopped green onions. So starting off with the chili garlic paste. Chili garlic paste is a, a condiment. It's crushed chilies with garlic, uh, a little bit of rice vinegar in there. Um, adding an additional amount of rice vinegar, not too much. A little bit of soy sauce, that's our uh, salting agent little sesame oil, adding a little fat and a little flavor there. Our ginger, use all of that. All the cilantro, and all of the scallions. Just gonna mix this up really well. It's a really nice marinade. It's one of my favorites. It works great with pork, um, not just for this particular cut of meat. It could be pork chops, bone in. Um, I also really like this marinade a lot with lamb. So lamb chops, uh, lamb loin chops, or lamb rack chops. Either one, this works great for that. You gotta kind of mix this a little vigorously to get the oil to mix into it. And once it's mixed, I'm just gonna pour a little bit right down the center of my platter here. I'm just gonna place my pork tenderloin right in this marinade. I want a fairly thick coating here. Um, a lot of marinade, so we want a lot of flavor on that piece of pork. So no need to season this. I've got plenty of seasoning in the marinade. Spoon a little bit of additional marinade over the top here. Move that around. And then this is going to go straight onto the grill. I am gonna oil the grill a little bit, mainly because this is a very sugary May, uh, preparation marinade, and that sugary preparation 
has a tendency to burn uh, pretty quickly and to stick and caramelize. So I wanna make sure that I can get that off of there. So we'll go to the grill. And that's gonna cook relatively quickly. So with that, I have uh, some Napa cabbage here. Napa cabbage is a leafy green, um, really, really watery type of vegetable, but it's got a nice sort of subtle cabbage flavor to it. And uh, I'm gonna grill a piece of this as an accompaniment to the pork tenderloin. So I'm just gonna cut a little wedge out of this. Um, And then I'm gonna take out the core section right here. But I wanna keep this intact again. I don't want the leaves to come apart. And then I'm just gonna dress this with a little bit of sesame oil. Clean up here, always. Uh, add a little salt. And just sort of coat this with the sesame oil. And that's gonna go on the grill right alongside of our pork tenderloin. So now I'm gonna cross this. You can see, got some nice char there. That's from the sugar. It does stick just a little bit. Remember I mentioned earlier about putting things on the grill that have a lot of oil on them and causing flare ups. So you can see all that oil drained off the Napa cabbage and started a little fire there in the bottom. And what I don't want is that black soot that comes from smoke all over my beautiful colored Napa cabbage. So let's move that right over there. So this is gonna take about another minute on this side, then I'm gonna turn it over and it'll take about an additional three minutes to cook. And our pork tenderloin is ready to plate. You can see the cabbage, beautiful coloration on that. You go right to the plate with that guy and the pork. Nice and juicy. So I'm just gonna cut this into three pieces. So you see a little char on the outside of this. That's what we want, that really nice flavor from the caramelized sugar in the sauce. And then I'm just gonna garnish with a little bit of black sesame seeds. And there we have our hoisin glazed pork tenderloin with grilled Napa cabbage. <laughs>